So uh, let's get started on this one. Um, we're talking about the CIAM process when we want to apply uh, a, a prep step, the assessment, the blueprint, the roadmap. Translation being, don't buy technology if you don't have your ducks in a row, right? We'll get into what that means and why. I love to say in these sessions, stop buying these guys software. Uh, I, we even do it when we do um, uh, vendor-specific events. We, we'll, we'll sponsor a vendor-specific event, and we say the same thing. Don't buy their software, and they all the sales guys start to shake. I'm like, uh, hopefully I brought some of my bigger guys with me to protect me at that point. Because here's the thing, um, if your processes are bad, if your data is bad, all the tech in the world just gives you a fast version of that. We don't want a fast version of crappy data and lousy process, so that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up here, since I know this is a longer session, we got the time, is why I have consumer IAM and customer IAM up there. This one's killing me. So uh, Gartner and, and really Forrester, for that matter, are pushing the C as consumer. And the rationale is this. And I, uh, I think hopefully by next year, everybody's on the same page with this one. We don't just call it, this is customer and this is consumer. Consumer IM is supposed to include various aspects. It can be customer. It can be business to business. It can be B to C, the C, by the way, for consumer. So it can be a direct customer. It can be uh, uh, both web and non-web driven. It can be, um, again, a, a business to business model uh, or a B to B to E or B to B to C model where uh, you, this business has their customers. You're actually providing some services that apply to them. So they're a consumer, but they're not your employee. They're their employees. There's your B to B to E or they're their customers, but you still offer bits and pieces around that. So technically they are still a consumer on your side. And then the straight up B to B model, these guys to you or vice versa. And then of course the B2C. I may have a direct customer to come in to buy stuff, get information, etc. So that's why customer, the C for customer in it, I, I'm not a big fan of. And fortunately, I'm, uh, well, not fortunately, I am following uh, what's going to become. It's getting there slowly but surely, the industry nomenclature behind it. So consumer, 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 when we say C-I-A-M. All right. That was a mouthful. All right, so we're going to talk about processes, procedures um, for building out an assessment, uh, a blueprint, and a roadmap, basically a true plan. And I want to thank you guys for coming today. And see us at the booth at the end of this uh, 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 when you guys walk out of here in the next 30 seconds. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha both. You had no clue. Did you think we were done? I saw the look on your face. All right. So if we can't have any fun, you sit in here and some guy sits back here and he's like, I'd like to talk to you about, uh, and then you want to, anyways. All right, so let's keep going. This I'm going to spend well under a minute on. Um, it's just so you get an idea who we are. So we've been around since 04, we're about 150 folks plus at this point, because this one's getting a little old. Um, we're everything from the consultative side, advisory, we actually have a couple product solutions, et cetera. Uh, I don't want to spend any more time on this other than to say that, look, uh, you can have a copy of this deck at the end. Uh, what they're going to do here, I think they usually will send out PDFs. We have this plus bonus material. So if you either get my card or at the end, it'll have my email address. It's just Todd at IDMWorks.com. You can have a copy of this with the extras, all the fun parts behind it. So you just shoot me a message at the end, not over LinkedIn, because if you ever tried to figure it out from there, it's a nightmare. Um, and I don't get notifications from them. So an email, Todd at IDMWorks.com. It'll be up at the end. Or get a business card from me at the end. Just reach out. You can have a copy, plus all the other stuff that we give out, the other Prezos. I'll send everything to you. And the, the extra versions, the ones you can't get here. All right, so uh, let's keep this going. First, assessing the organization's CIAM maturity. Uh, and I call it CIAM because somebody now is already going CIAM, and I'm like, ugh, just shoot me. So uh, CIAM uh, is what I'm sticking with here. Uh, what you're about to see for the people who are in the last one, it looks pretty much the same. And I'm going to talk about where the differences are because they're a little under the covers. When we're talking about the maturity model, this applies to identity and access management from an enterprise perspective as well. And I even put the little note, look, it looks very familiar to that one. 
the enterprise being your internal, your employees, contractors, consultants, and the like. Why is this somewhat similar? Well, from a maturity perspective, these guys suffer even more typically. The governance around it, all over the map, all over the place. Different portals, different needs. They all have different backend technology, different rules. Why? Because they didn't treat this like we treat enterprise IAM. What we've been getting over and over and over again when we talk to prospective customers, it's usually someone from the IAM side going, I never had to deal with this before. They just put it on my plate. And why they put it on their plate and why I made this one red is because the priorities were being set from the business. Because for them, the true ROI is return on investment. We said in the other one, from a risk management approach, and that's where this is moving, we have an alternative version. ROI being risk of incarceration, right? Um, because there's civil and criminal penalties. Well, I, most of them never cared until they started getting fines, until GDPR came out, until California Privacy Act, and more is coming. There's a couple other states that are teeing up their version. California privacy keeps getting tweaked. There's going to be federal ones around that are expanding around healthcare. OC, I don't know, there's four letters. I hate acronyms. It's like CIAM, right? Um, too many acronyms. Uh, so there's a, a federal one for the healthcare side um, that's getting decided on. Uh, I don't know if it got published yet. And there's more coming. Pretty soon, we will have national ones as well, which is actually probably easier as opposed to trying to figure out and pick and choose between states. I say pretty soon, we're in the right place for this one. It could be soon, it could take half a decade, it could take, you know, part of its politics, administration, who knows. The point being, it will come. And I'm sure when you've been in other sessions, they've spoken to this. At least I hope they did. So the question is, do we do it now to stay ahead of it? Or are we being forced now because regulation is pushing us already? And that's where this is coming from. So 99% of the calls we're getting right now is because of regulation. And that one's a little different than what's going on in the enterprise. The enterprises, they truly need to shore up these gaps, whereas this one, they know they got the gaps. They didn't care so much until they found out, wow, GDPR is uh, on the low end, 2% uh, of revenue, $20 million, whichever is higher. If it's a major one, 4% of revenue, $40 million, whichever is higher for the year. That's pretty big. Yeah. All right, so things are moving now. This is now coming into focus, and that's why you see so much on consumer. Because what drives technology? What drives technology? What's the biggest driver of technology? Not bad. I was going to say porn. <laughs> it's true. You look this one up, it's true. Yes, exactly. So he's, he's right. Right? But OK, what's second? What's the biggest driver? Really, the regulation side. People will start needing this and doing this because they're forced to. When you're forced to, you do that because you have no choice. And heads start to roll when you get fined and people go to jail. We want to avoid that. So it's now become the norm here from the consumer aspect, where for years, nobody was really bothering. They were best effort, low end, what's the minimum I have to do, and they can't do that anymore. So uh, the goal here is to build a true structure. I say from an enterprise perspective, in a sense, yes, because your organization has to come to an agreement. There are various requirements that change that are not the same as the enterprise side. Enterprise does typically, it's in most cases, uh, uh, one set of policies in a sense to rule them all. Yes, you may have multiple policies, but you have a central point. Whereas things, when you get talking about consumer, especially if you're like a multinational, look, we may have what we need for uh, uh, the European side and, and US side, but then we have data segregation that has to exist in its own rules because uh, China, we have uh, 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 operations applicable to China, Russia, et cetera, and they say, no, 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 we have our own version our own rules you have to follow and you have to segregate. So you end up with a lot of different solution needs, requirements, sets that sometimes at the front end you can manage well, but on the back end you're going to have some different solutions. Or potentially um, similar solutions but extra instances, a separate one for this, a separate one for that. And that tends to be a big uh, delineator and that's also why from a grand, so to speak, enterprise type perspective, you didn't see that. But now we're getting forced to take that overarching view and that's why the guys who are on the enterprise IAM side were struggling a bit. The other thing is when we're talking about consumer, 
Most of this revolves around access management. Provisioning is a little aspect of it, more just in time than anything. But it's mostly access management, whereas enterprise, we've got the provisioning piece, the, the deep into the segregation of duties, the uh, various control models, a privileged account management. Do these things exist within this? Yes. But I hate to say it to somewhat of a lesser degree, because it's more truly the access authentication and authorization more than anything take the lead. Now, the jellyfish I used in the last one, that, uh, this is why folks who haven't been in the last one should probably send me where we talk about that. Some of the key components when we get to that, and I'll show you this jellyfish, a little bit different, and you're going jellyfish, what's a jelly? And we'll get to that. Um, authentication and authorization were key components, and, and the one we built for the next one is a little different. All right. Once we've done this, we got a vision, we got a, 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 an architecture everybody agrees to. Now we can say, okay, great. We understand what our need is. We understand the rules for the road. We now be have, want to be able to drive this into what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? We got agreement on with the business. This is the worst part. Getting these individual business lines to sign off and agree to this is very difficult. It may take a thumb on their throat, no, no, OK, OK, fine, until they come to an agreement. And it may take a bit of a hammer. Because people uh, still on this side tend to want to do their own thing. Yeah, it's my portal. I built it. It's our line of business. That's all I care. That's what I'm responsible for. Don't mess with me. So you have to have that regulatory hammer, or you have to have that corporate hammer behind it, so to speak, to make sure that these things get done. It's more difficult than on the enterprise side, so it's coming around slowly but surely. A lot of orgs are still they're making that case. And I go back to something I did in the last one, which is when you have somebody who manages this, if it falls under the CISO, for example, well, guess what? The CISO needs this to keep his job or her job, their job. So the example I used in the last one is this. The CISO is your secret service guy, because we're in uh, DC, so this works. He's got the little wire to his ear. But if he doesn't have bulletproof vest, et cetera, we got a problem. Because what's his job to take the bullet? If he doesn't have the armor, how's he going to take that bullet? Well, he's going to take it well. He's going to be gone. That's why CISO is career is soon over. That's the other way to do the acronym. Yeah, career is soon over. Yeah, CISO. That's the problem. Average lifespan of a CISO, the last time I read it, was about two years. However. I haven't seen that in a while, so I don't know if that's changed since. But I can tell you this, I see a lot of CISO movements still to this day. It's a tough position. And if you don't have the proper armor, you're always going to be in that scope. All right. So if it falls under them, that's where this fun part comes in. So let's keep going with this. Um, so we want to align a methodology. Now, this one's a little bit different. In the last one, we said, hey, no more than six months of phase. We believe that as well. However, these things may go much quicker. When you're talking about an enterprise side, you have so many tendrils, so many things to hit. It may be a three plus year project, uh, or not projects, <laughs> program. Uh, with swim lanes and phases. We, we try to keep the model of the nothing more than six months, knowing that a lot of these may be a couple weeks. You may have one project that's a two-weeker that feeds into a one-monther. They don't all have to be waterfalls some places we've gone to. They do, because one feeds into the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, I have yet to go to an organization, though, that's needed from a consumer side to plan more than two years. I'd say the average is about a year's worth of planning at a time that I've seen in this. I don't see too many going three, four, or five on the consumer side. Because it's access management, they can define what the issues are and work on them. And it tends to be much quicker. It's mostly a fear thing. People they get confused because they haven't done it yet. And they think it's bigger, but it's not. The example being, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about federation with people, and they're like, I don't really necessarily completely get the federation. I say, uh, uh, do you do a, a single sign on now out there? Or what do you do? And they're like, yeah. Well, it's just a real big version of that. Who's the biggest uh, federated uh, uh, vendor out there right now? The uh, biggest uh, federated implementation, I should say. Any guesses? Really? Not bad, not bad. Facebook. I can take my Facebook account. I can go to abcnews.com, and I should say, you are an idiot, and your opinion means nothing, and, blah, and I can troll away. Right? Why? Because I can use my Facebook, my social credential there, login, to access this little aspect from a service perspective, and only that. But I can then use that at another site. And another site, I can use it for purchasing things and some, et cetera. It's 
big implementation. They're the identity provider, and although they have their own services, they also apply to service providers that use that as the identity, the social login. Anyways, point I'm saying here is, let's build a model that works, that we all agree to, that we get sign off, and let's run with it. And if we get to this quote unquote optimized state, do not leave it there. Everything changes in this field, and a lot of IT fields, every 36 months. That's why we never tell an org to plan out more than maybe three and a half, four on the, on the, if you have to. Do not do a five year plan because nobody ever really hits four and five because everything's changed. Remember when everyone was talking blockchain? Was that last year, year before? Or Chicago? I think two years ago, that was a big one here at the show. Not that everyone's doing it now, but you look at the cycle. Do you see a lot of blockchain discussions going on right now? No. I mean, some people might be talking about it, but things shift. Or to the next thing and the next thing. Even cloud and putting our security in the cloud six years back. So two rounds of this, people were talking about nobody was doing. That one hit its stride, of course. But it's funny because now who doesn't? What organization doesn't go, we're cloud first? You go, what does that mean? You know, cloud. Anyways. Exactly. All right. This is where it gets a little different. So challenges and drivers. So first, what is the challenge. And I've bundled it into these three high level questions because they tend to be our drivers when we build this process out for organizations and that if you're doing it yourself, you should be building out. First, can you support a single organization model? And it's this. Uh, we've done this for a few organizations and I, it seems to always be the same no matter where we go. Uh, uh, recent one, you know, a number of, of different portals. They had um, direct consumers, so customers who could buy direct. They had the business to business piece. They had a provider model, and those guys, of course, had their own consumers. It required delegation, so for them to be able to set those guys up within this process, there was a delegated model. They had regulation behind it that was the big driver. In their case, because it was multinational, GDPR was their big driver. We had another one right before that where California privacy, because they hit the threshold, it's, you have to one of the three, and one of them was like $25 million worth of business in a year in California, and like, ah, crap. The other two they didn't hit, they thought they got away. So they had to deal with it. The point being that um, if all of these are separate business lines, I got a different portal for this, so I got a different need for that, et cetera, we don't have any unification. And where we tend to hit a brick wall is this application or, or this portal and on the back end has a different technology. We require, uh, 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 we create a login name in the process. All I care about is your, maybe I use social uh, uh, identity, uh, social login uh, as, as an ability. This one over here, it's more than information. So they need to create uh, uh, an ID and they go unique identifier and all I need is your first name, last name, and maybe email. This one comes up and I need some more data because some of this stuff's regulated and I need to uh, see what you're allowed to buy, what other data, so I need more data points. That's problematic. So we want to make sure that we can unify our registration method first and foremost. And that is kind of the low hanging fruit. Look, if right now we know at a minimum, the very bare minimum, we need first name, last name, and a unique email, it's a heck of a start. We use that for registration and now down to the next step, when I go into the uh, uh, specific portal or specific solution that needs more data, upon that first time in, I can get that more data. That's one aspect. But we have a unified uh, 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 registration model at a minimum. Now, is that fit for everybody? No, but it is uh, one of the big needs and when we get to the next slide, which will be on the drivers, on, on where that fits into place based off of regulation. Do we have a single model to get this done? Second, actually, I'm not even going to go second yet. To go back to that use case I was saying, that recent organization, because of the different models, they had different back-end data stores. One was a, a, a database-driven, one was a, a LDAP, one was AD, we'll call it another LDAP for now, sort of. Um, and then there was... I think one of them was even a, an old archaic, uh, uh, no longer out there LDAP as well from uh, Sun, we'll leave it at that. Um, and they were all different. And, and where they were having problems was if I was a customer in two, fo focuses, two, two points of this, whether from the B2B to C or B2C, I may have a credential, say T. Rossin was it. I'm not saying he's going to pick something, T. Ross first the last. 
um, with a password. And in yours, it also does TROS, but the password's different. There was mass confusion for the customer base. Or they have something altogether different. And I'm like trying to do TROS, and I'm like, why is it not working? So the employee aspect, i.e. the support, customer support, was having so many headaches because we didn't have a unified method. Mm, you can see where this can get ugly. All right. Next up. <clears throat> Actually, I'm sorry to do this. I'm dying a little bit here. This is not a stalling thing, I promise. When you have multiple solutions like that, multiple points, a, a, a portal or otherwise, We want to make sure from an authentication point of view we're doing something about it. Can I log in once and get to any of those other portals, any of those other facets? If it's something where we have to take another step, are we uh, adding in a stronger authentication model, i.e. adaptive? OK, this here, it's not that simple. There's PII or PHI or whatever it may be behind it. We need additional credentials. That may be uh, low-hanging fruit emailing them a code because we have an older user base that doesn't have the phone and we don't register it. Or maybe we do, or whatever the, the magic we decide on from a multi-factor approach. Can I, though, for the rest, log in once and get to any of them? There's a couple of cool resource, uh, retail sites out there that you can do exactly that. As a matter of fact, that's where the experience piece comes into play, too. Everyone likes to talk about the digital experience, to saying, hey, you came into uh, this site, and uh, you like Hawaiian shirts in red. You went to uh, one of the other sites, uh, and uh, hey, I'm going to let you know, here's our selection of red Hawaiian shirts. And I'm going to add that to marketing, so they're going to email you deals on red Hawaiian shirts. And you're going to say, I never did any of that, and I don't like red Hawaiian shirts. But now you're screwed. So the point being that um, we want to be able to tailor the experience from a financial aspect. Hey, uh, we know from a net worth perspective, you're putting into high yield CDs, which I don't even know what those truly are at the end of the day uh, anymore. But uh, we're putting in high yield CDs. Here's some other things you might want to consider. Oh, hey, you happen to have a real big bank balance. You're not doing anything with it. Every time you come into the bank, they bug you on that one. Let's take it a step further. Now I'm going to bug you even more. It's going to go to your email. It's going to pop up uh, to your phone. It's going to do all these things to try and get you to go to specific vehicles that we think best apply to you. Same with healthcare. Uh, you're, you're, you're diabetic, and you come in and you're buying uh, insulin from us. Hey, uh, new pumps are coming out for this uh, that, uh, because of the type of the, you know, type 1 type versus type 2. You're type 1, and blah, 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 all these other things we know about you. Here's what we think you should be looking at, what's coming down next to take a look at. So the digital experience. But from a security aspect, is really where we're focused here. All right. Next up, do we have manageable processes around this identity life cycle? which really feeds into the next of, do you know your customer? Because what are these processes? Well, it's one thing to do a quick little, hey, we created an account for you. That's why I said provisioning tends to be a lighter touch on this. But the real question here is, once I have created this, what can you do? Can you come back in at any point in time and say, no, my info's changed? Can you come back in at any point in time and say, I want to update it? I want to know what I consented to. Do you know how now every time you go on a website, it's like we use cookies. Click here if you want to read the cookie thing. That's, that's a big uh, uh, aspect of it. This is why that's in place, is simply because you have to have the ability to see what you're agreeing to. And if it's every time in that particular case, that's why you keep getting these cookie messages. However, you have to have the ability to go in and see those consents and opt out. Now, it's not across the board opt out. GDPR has more regs around that so far than we do on this side. However, you have to be able to see them. You have to be able to opt out where you can opt out. And although it's not on here, I believe, um, with GDPR especially, it has to be portable. I have to be able to take that, get a copy of that information, pull that information down. And it's written, interestingly enough, uh, that it has to be easy, which is lovely when you think about that. Oh, it's got to be easy. Here's the headache about these things. Uh, uh, who here has seen the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie? All right. There's a line. I, I love this one to this day. Um, is it Elizabeth Swan? I don't remember what her name is. The, 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 the main character, uh, um, uh, the girl, the woman in it, um, she says, um, uh, she gets captured by the pirates. And the pirates say, they say, um, you know, we're going to take you. We're going to throw you overboard or whatever it is. And she goes, parlay. They're like, what? She goes, the pirate code says that I can parlay, which means you have to give me a, a, a meeting with the captain. And they stop her, and they're like, well, it's not really a hard and fast rule. It's a guideline. 
And that's what a lot of these regulations are. California Privacy Act, GDPR. They're more or less stating, here's basically what I want you to do. And if you do it wrong, I'm going to fine you. But they don't give you a lot of the detail, which is where the headache comes into this. So having said that, this is what you'll see on the next slide shortly, the drivers that come behind it, that if you don't know your customer and you don't make it easy, they're going to fine you. And you go, well, what is easy? Parlay. It's a guideline. You don't know till you don't know. That's the headache. All right, so we're going to keep going with this. Um, separate from that aspect of I want to be able to see my data, change my data, pull out my data, opt out, know what I've, I've done, where I'm going, so to speak, you have to be able to prove that you can do all this. That's the fun part of regulation. And then the last piece being are we good stewards of the data? Can we detect and prevent threats? from that perspective. And why? Because the data's what all these regs are about. Not your identity, it's the data. It just so happens that it can be identifiable data, it could be health-related data, but it's the data, the data, the data, the data is the big driver. And a lot of organizations have lousy data, to be honest. Data's all over the place. You get duplicates here. You got this from here because you got regulations behind it, uh, 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 HIPAA, SOX, et cetera. You, you can't give the wrong person the wrong information, all that fun stuff. Why? It's data, data, data behind it. All right. So let's jump ahead. There were a couple at the end, but I want to make sure that we have time for questions. What are the drivers? So these are basically the collection from those questions that we just reviewed. What are the big drivers? Well, when we get contacted on this side for the consumer side, people are saying, I got to understand the following. First, entity registration. I call them entities because entity is better than user because it may be a B2B where it's not necessarily an individual entity. Similar when you're on the enterprise and you have non-human accounts as well, right? When you have non-human accounts, that's why I started calling them ent entities, just make it easier. I think there was an old horror movie with that one too. So every time I, I think about the entity, go look it up. Scared the crap out of me when I was little. All right, entity registration. How are we doing that registration, as said before, and also the social aspect behind it? Why I say the social aspect is eh, half the time, more than half the times, majority of the times, actually, this one isn't really even being included because the social piece has been more about, ah, they got to get some information, so I can use it for more of a marketing perspective if I get that social identity. But for the majority of the folks from a security perspective, they're not doing a lot on the social identity integration, although you can. But how are we registering it? How are we collecting that data and the consents behind it? The management, as we described from the questions, the storage and security. These, all that you see here, tie to GDPR, as well as, with the exception of maybe one, um, the California Privacy Act. I, I, I don't recall if they have an, uh, an erasure uh, aspect uh, in CPI, if, it, if anybody remembers your CPI. They do. All right. That was the one I, I haven't been able to. Uh, look back on before I did this one. All right, so it does. So how are we doing the account creation? And deprovisioning is a part of it because you don't want to sit on this stuff till the end of time necessarily. You may have a use case to keep it, but data does get stale. And we may need to clean things up from time to time simply because we don't want to get hit on a regulatory. All right. Now we get to the assurance piece. And that's where we said, OK, well, what are the next steps? So depending on your use cases, you may need a multi-factor approach. Name and password may not be good enough. Now on enterprise side, everyone wants to move away from it. You may not be so lucky when it comes to consumer facing. Depending on the audience, you still get stuck with that in a lot of cases. And now it comes down to, do we need an additional factor? Again, that may be just emailing a code to somebody at and, and, and the lowest level, or it may be like all the banks, and et cetera. You know, you, you're utilizing a, a device, right? And there's, of course, issues there as well. So depending on the need and the complexity will drive what you need from that secondary factor, but also you have to be aware that there's still issues even with multi-factor from a breach perspective. Um, we actually get asked a lot, too, about password lists. And I know there's some, some sessions here about password lists. And I'm all in favor of password lists. I, I do like keeping some aspect of it in a sense. So I'll tell you for our organization, where everything multi-factor, doesn't matter who you are, what you do. 
everything is, uh, 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 at a minimum, is a secondary factor. It also has adaptive authentication. So if it's something a little more on the, the what I'll call the privileged or elevated side, there's additional requirements there, as well as IP focused and uh, um, uh, geofencing. Um, but we kept the passwords. We don't have a complex password need, and we don't require anyone to change. And I haven't changed mine in the better part of, I'm going to say, eight years now. Matter of fact, it may or may not be IDM 8675309. Just saying. Right? The uh, reason being is it actually kind of serves as a honeypot. I love the when we get the messages, I've been pwned, and they have it. Oh, yeah, I've seen my password all over the place, even my personal ones. So I kind of like it. Let them go focus on that. Eventually, yes, we'll get the no passwords at all, and then somebody will have some major breach to figure out how to get around it because that's what they do when we have day jobs. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you'll see passwords come back, which I'll chuckle, but hopefully not. Um, all right, so to keep this going now, we have to be able to uh, report and allow for uh, utilizationally analytic side of this. We talked about how the red Hawaiian shirts and be able to uh, uh, do the digital experience, but also from a security perspective. So the tools have been up and coming in that. There's a couple of really good ones on that digital experience side, and everybody's soon following suit. But again, because this is still somewhat newer in terms of our three-year cycle, our 36-month cycle, more seems to be popping up every day. And the paradigms keep shifting. All right. Um, and then, of course, our friend compliance with privacy regulations. So what are we covering? So I've changed the jellyfish. So you remember before, the jellyfish was uh, uh, identities and entitlements. Uh, we had uh, intelligence. And we had auth and auth as part of access. Well, we've changed it for this one. First of all, uh, the why we are doing this to begin with is uh, kind of funny to me, because that hasn't changed from the enterprise side. We want to make sure the right, peop right people are getting access to the right things at the right time for the right reasons, except they should have said entities and that we can prove it. I like to put it in this perspective. Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the library. If I can't tell you that, I didn't do my job. All right. So what we're assessing to go back to this from the consumer side. We said identity. That includes registration, provisioning those pieces. And you'll see our version of the jellyfish. We call this the jellyfish for those who weren't here for the last one who had a different jellyfish, because I know it's a circle. But when you look at the top down at a jellyfish, they kind of look like circles. They're not quite exactly the perfect shape. So when you turn them on the side, you see all those tendrils. So that's what we're going to do. Consumer side, the identity we just spoke to, profiling consent. I'm not going to beat this horse to death here, guys. Uh, and then the threat detection and prevention. It ties back to everything I've been talking about for the last 40 minutes that you're probably getting bored with. All right. We turn it on its side. We got the jellyfish. Remember, you can have a copy of this at the end, because watch this. See? Eh? You can have a copy of this, but only if I get a copy of the picture you just took. All right, so uh, uh, again, the grouping, similar to the last one, they don't completely fit into each. It wasn't meant to when I build this, but uh, there's a lot of crossover there. So the different aspects. We talked about the registration side. Profile verification, we didn't get too deeply into. I say verification, there's different models there. Do you need to verify the person that is registered? Verification goes deeper than that. Verify may be as simple as I send something back to, uh, or I, I, I pop something up saying, you know, are you a robot or not? Uh, validation, maybe I send something to your email, for example. If I have to get into authentication, now we're talking about identity proofing and we get into the weeds. All right, you may need that. Uh, we then have, from that lifecycle management, here's a, another piece and aspect we didn't cover yet, identity data aggregation. Again, if they're in all different stores, you need to make it simple. If I can't pull out the consents that are in seven different backend systems easily, I may be risking a fine. Right? How do we aggregate that data, and how do we make sure that you, as the consumer, are seeing what you're supposed to be seeing? You better not be seeing what I have, or we got another headache on our hands. We talked about the, the authentication side and the adaptive piece, or the risk-based. Uh, in the preference management, we talked about that. Opt-in, out-out, I'm not going to bother with that as well. Audit and compliance, we talked about here. Uh, we have to be able to prove it. A lot of organizations need to do, under the governance piece, correlation and cleanup. 
A lot of organizations that we go to, because this was Wild West for so long, they may have four different instances of Todd out there with different pieces of data, or maybe not. They may have two Todd Rossins, but one's in Iowa and he's 59, and, and one's here, and he's going to pretend to be younger than he is. Now he is, and he's uh, 45, jeez, wow, and, and lives in, in, outside of Philadelphia, right? I better not get Iowa guy, and he better not get mine, right? All right. We want to have things correlated and cleaned up, and if there's multiple backend systems, we have a very big risk in that regard. Uh, we talked about the self-service piece, and now we get to the last piece, threat detention and prevent, uh, detection and prevention. Now, this one we barely hit, really, uh, when you think about it, because for that, we would have to get into the weeds. Uh, and there's really comes down to your need and your use case. So we've done this a few times in regards to, uh, we understand that we have data requirements here from a security point of view. What are those stores? What can we do with that data from an analytics approach? And a lot of these tools are still up and coming. That's the headache with it. A lot of new tools. I'd swear there's at least three vendors here I never even heard of that I'm not sure are older than about six months now out there. And every year, that's what I love about these shows. We get to see the next. And every three years, there's that big shift. And all of a sudden, everything moves to the next thing. That's why these things are so great, aren't they? We have to guess if they're going to stick around. So on that blockchain <coughs> notice, um, sorry. Um, API management, API security is a big piece. A lot of organizations out there, we have this approach where so many different backend models and technologies that we're not properly governing these homegrown tools that are being built, homegrown portals and solutions behind it. How are we managing those? Uh, not just purely uh, uh, from an API model, but even let's uh, look at authentication gateway, for example. How are we driving uh, from an authentication standpoint to these things, as well as how are they built and locked down. And there's a lot of legacy applications doing this out there that are wide open, and that's the headache. All right. And then, of course, entitlement side. We didn't get too deep in the weeds, but there is still the need for potentially roles. It may be as simple as a standard customer, but it may be patient, patient type, and there are eight different types. It may be. Uh, 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 Various business types from a B2B that we use. We may still need, and in a lot of cases do, a, an actual role model to govern this. And it actually is a lot easier than doing it from the enterprise because the number of roles are typically a lot less. But if not, and we have to go beyond and we have to get super fine grained or fine grained at all, we may need to expand and do things like an attribute based policy and attribute based access control type model, where it's basically, hey, we really have to lock this stuff down. And I want to know not who you are, I need to know what you are. And that goes to the next step, saying, hey, uh, I go in and I say, but I'm T. Ross in 8675309. That's my password, right? And that's great when I'm trying to get in the club because the guy, the authentication bouncer at the door says, oh, yeah, here you are. You're on the list. Come on in. Now I get in, and I want to go over here where I know you got this big file cabinet of other people's information, maybe some on me as well. I want to be able to go there and pull that information. He says, whoa, 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 hold on. I go, but I'm T. Ross and 8675309. He goes, that's great. I don't care who you are. What are you? What are the values that we can pull from various attributes? Oh, I'm uh, one of the owners. Yeah, that's OK. What else? Uh, I'm an owner, and I do HR. Uh, I know this is a horrible one, but I'm using the club example. OK, it doesn't really apply in the customer. But you get the point I'm saying is, and the job code's 1313, and this and that, and all these pieces of data that say, OK, you're allowed to go in and look through any of these read only. If you don't have uh, 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 one of these that are required from the policy perspective, you can't even see it. Or you can't open it. You can't unlock it, whatever that may be. I'll, uh, forget unlock, that's authentication. However, now, if I want to make changes to it, I have to have that model and then some of the other attributes that allow me. And if I don't, fail deny by default, so strong authorization approach. And we're almost there. Now, this one took me more time in the last one. Uh, I'm going to run out of time if I do it otherwise. How do we do this? It is very similar to what we do in the enterprise model. And I did this in the last session, but it's this. We want to get on the ground, understand what are the wants and needs of the organization. That may just be regulatory driven. That's fine. We may need to take a step further on this one and say, OK, that's great, but what are the gaps and issues? Just saying I know I have to fulfill GDPR is not usually good enough because I need to know, hey, this thing's using this legacy database that's already got a lot of holes in it. We've got some gaps there to fill. So what are the actual gaps and issues? Pull that data in. Build out what does this mean to the organization, be able to explain it. If you can't explain it in English, you can't explain it. What are the risks if I don't do anything, i.e. the costs of doing nothing? Now, 
funny thing with regulation is it doesn't give you much of a, 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 a choice. But what else? Once we got this defined, we can figure out what are the requirements to mitigate these issues. Build out a true set of requirements. Now, this is very similar to our enterprise side. True set of requirements to mitigate this. Now we know what the problem is and the requirements to mitigate it. What do we do next? Let's pretend time, money, resources don't exist. I know that those are constraints. We all have them. Take those off the table, build reference architectures. If we were to take all of these requirements, what would this thing look like when we build out an enterprise, uh, enterprise an architecture, a consumer I am architecture for this, everything. Don't think product, keep product out of the mix. What do you need? Build this out. There should be no vendor in this, it's vendor neutral until it's time to talk vendors. Build this out, reference architectures. Take functions for it and now you can run your gap analysis. So if it's a, a unified registration, here's what we're doing currently, i.e. the eight different models. Here's based on this future state what we're gonna do. The one unified model, what's behind it. Here's the requirement that this would mitigate, which should map to those issues, what we just said we documented. And we got full traceability, full line of traceability. We have a case for this now. So now we've done two thirds. We want to go into the roadmap. Here's the thing about the roadmap. You gotta put the constraints back in. The reason we took them out was so we can see what this thing ideal state would look like. We're not gonna do everything. Nobody has ever done everything. Put time, resource, constraints back in, and if we've prioritized our uh, issues, we know what we need to do first, second, third, fourth, 1A, 1B, 1C maybe. And now you can build out a logical roadmap. Uh, this is very different from the enterprise side because the enterprise side is typically a three plus year endeavor. A lot of times with consumer, it could be 12 months, it could be six months, it could be two years. I have yet to go to one that's been more than two years by default because Although there's a lot to it and a lot of user base, the um, uh, number of systems and methodologies behind it are much simpler. However, never go more than six months for a phase so that you can show in production things. Now, in consumer side, that may be two weeks for this. It feeds into another project that's one month, et cetera, until we hit that six month mark. But where are we gonna be at six months at a max? You can change that as you see fit. We like to go with that because uh, I used this in the last one. If I came to you and said, here's a two year project, for all of this, one big pot of money, somebody's gonna go, ah, it's great, hit the button, floor opens up, I go, ah, I'm down by my car. They don't wanna hear from that. So, build this out, and then every item within your roadmap, you have to treat from a project perspective. And why I say that is this, take that individual project and build out what's it gonna take to do. So, first, what are the constraints and dependencies? If it's technical, dev to test the prod, what are the steps? High level, I mean, we're not talking vendor yet. Don't talk vendor, you're gonna plug that in after. Next up, um, dev to test the deliverables. Oh, resources required, I knew I was skipping one. Do I need a 50% PM on this one, a half time architect slash tech lead? Do I need an engineer full time? You know, if we know it's a month long or whatever, we can figure out numbers based off of that because if we know now, what goes into it? Oh, and define the deliverables, by the way. I, I skipped this one in the last one. I could kick myself for it. Uh, do you need a, a, a design document in it, a test plan, rollback guide if you're replacing or cutover plan, uh, uh, administrative guides, uh, so on and so forth? Define those. Get them out of the way. Um, your PMs will love you for it, your PMO. Um, and then you can cost and budget it. I'm gonna use the uh, three months as an example because it's easier on me and my math head and then this is my second one here. So if I had, I'm gonna go, uh, unlikely, a 10% PM need, and it's a three-month project. A full-timer for a, 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 a three-month project is, uh, by rule of thumb, about 500 hours. 10% PM, so that's 50 hours. 50 hours, let's say, uh, internal or external rate, whatever you're using, or a blend, or whatever those are, let's say it was uh, $100 an hour. 50 times 100, we got a $5,000 resource. We had all the resources together. We have our raw cost of what we gotta do from a budget perspective. Next up. Out of variance. I said this in the last one, typical rule of thumb that we work with, for example, is 20% variance for architectural review boards, phase gate committees, whatever those things and needs are, minimum 20%. In Canada, that's 100%. I don't know why, but they always make us do 100% variance, so just double the cost. All right, it's true, it's bizarre, but it's true. Last piece of it is, now we have a plan. We know the problems, hopefully. We know the issues, we know the requirements to mitigate it, we know what this thing would look like ideally, we have reference architectures, we know the plan to get there. We're still missing one thing, even though we got the costs and the people and all that. What we're missing here is 
product. Now go look at product. Now go talk to the software vendors and say, here's what I need. I can build an RFP out of that. I can build a business case out of it. I can put all the bits and pieces that I need to get this thing running. Now I can say, well, here's three vendors we know of hand that could do this. Let's send it out to them. The pros, the cons. Here's the other 7, 10, 800, whatever the number is, vendors. Why we're not doing or talking to those vendors. Why they're not really a fit, even if they say they are. Or, alternatively, if you're going right to RFP, that may do it for you as well, depending on the number you're sending out. So we have a full process. Plan, build, run, plan, build, run. We can keep it going. And then, of course, governance being the big aspect. If we're not communicating properly and we don't have good governance behind it, guess what happens? Hey, ops, we just uh, put this in. And then they go, what? When did you buy it? Not like a year ago. Well, we had this big project to put it in. Oh, OK, when's it going live? Yo, yesterday. OK, yeah. And then they want to murder. They want to murder you. They want to murder everybody. And you can't blame them for that. Communications are a huge aspect of this model. In order to do that, well, we have to maintain the momentum. First and foremost, you have to show results. If you don't show results, none of it matters at the end of the day. But if you're not communicating these results, then you got a bigger problem, believe it or not. Well, no, not a bigger problem, a lesser problem, because hopefully you'll have success. But that lesser problem is this. My project was great. We, we followed this model with the exception of this communications piece. So after a year, everything was great. Everybody's happy. I didn't get budget for a year or two, because nobody uh, on the budget side knew about this. I didn't get money. They, I got denied. This guy right here, Steve, he did it. His stuff failed left, right, and center, but he was great on communications, got that budget stuff in, and he got budget for a year or two. And I want to be mad at him, but I can't be mad at him. It was my fault. All right, so we only got about a minute, believe it or not, for questions on this. We can get into more details. You can come get a business card from me if you don't, or you can do a, this one you're allowed to take a picture of, Todd at IDMWorks.com. We have more versions of this information out there. Shameless self-promotion, yes, we do this, because somebody always asks the question, if you aren't doing this, can't do this, uh, have no wish to do it, we do. Feel free to contact us, and we can run with it and talk to you. We'll even show you over an hour in WebEx exactly what we put together. I'm always happy to do that. That's as much of the shameless self-promotion I want to do. If you email me at Todd at IDMWorks, don't do LinkedIn because you can link into me. I can't get you docs over that. It's such a pain in the butt. So shoot me an email. I'll send you this. I'll send you the, the PowerPoint version from the other presentation, including the enterprise. And we have some extras that we don't have included otherwise. So shoot me a message or come get a business card. It's also got my info on it. Thank you. Oh, questions. Crap. Does anybody have any questions? I ran out of time. Almost ran out of time. Anybody got any questions? Thank goodness, because you can ask them anyways at the end of this. Thank you. <laughs>